Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's program. It's Virtual Reality and Engaging the Past. It's with John Hickman. And I'm very glad to have John here. John is a, a historian who has a podcast called The Tattooed Historian, which is something that I encourage everyone to check out. I also wanted to let everyone know that this program is brought to you by the Yonkers Historical Society. And we're glad to have the Yonkers Historical Society as partners with the library. So I am looking forward to your program, John, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much, Mike, for allowing me to be here this evening. I really do appreciate that. And uh, this is definitely something that's going to be a little bit different for some people uh, to think about going into the future. We are really at the cusp of something great with virtual reality and the history field, and I'm very, very excited about that. So I hope that everyone enjoys what we're going to be discussing tonight, uh, because it is going to be a really unique experience and one that I am deeply invested in. And I know that a lot of my colleagues and friends are deeply invested in. We want to make history accessible to as many of you as possible. And one way to do that is to bring you into the space through something like virtual reality. A few years ago, I started my brand, The Tattooed Historian, to make history accessible to the masses. And this is one way that we are going to be doing that. A lot of my colleagues and friends are heavily involved in this venture. And I'm so excited to see what the future holds for these kinds of things. In fact, here beside me, I actually have my VR headset uh, ready to go. And uh, how did we get to this little device is something we're going to be talking about tonight, the accessibility feature of virtual reality. So what is virtual reality? Virtual reality technology is a computer generated, interactive and immersive experience that simulates a three dimensional virtual environment. We usually experience this through a head mounted display, such as the one I just showed you. And sometimes we combine it with other technologies such as vests and handheld devices. Virtual reality combines computer graphics, audio and other sensory inputs to create a simulated environment that gives users such as us the illusion of being physically present and allows us to interact with and explore this virtual world, which we seemingly are plopped into in our devices. The ultimate goal of virtual reality or VR is to create a sense of space where users perceive and interact with the virtual setting as if it were real, enabling a wide range of applications in areas such as gaming, education, and training. And to this day, we're seeing almost weekly initiatives coming out on how to make this even more accessible for a lot of us. But this little device that I held up at the beginning, this Oculus device that I have and I use and I study, uh, how did we get here? What are the roots of virtual reality? Well, for that, you have to go all the way back to the 1960s. People have been thinking about this for some time in the 1950s, but it wasn't until the 1960s that people started to really begin to build things to make this come to life. And a cinematographer named Morton Heilig wanted to bring his audience closer to the action in his films. And in 1955, he writes a paper entitled The Cinema of the Future. In it, Heilig described how he wished to place the audience in a kind of multi-sensory theater setting where you could effectively shut out the world around you and concentrate on the film in various ways. In 1962, he built his prototype for this sort of experience, and it's in this photo, the Sensorama. In addition, he produced five short films to accompany this invention. We'll talk about one of those now. The machine, the Sensorama, included a color display, odor emitters, fans, a stereo sound system and a chair that moved with the action on the screen. 
viewers took the place of a motorcycle rider in one of these films in the streets of New York. When the forward motion of the experience began, the fan would kick on and it was like wind whipping through your hair. He also simulated the noise of the city through recordings that he had done, and that was piped through those stereo sound speakers. When the rider approaches a bus, the odor of exhaust is pumped through the sensorama to make this, the experience even more realistic. Chemicals were used to make this smell as well as not just exhaust, but a local pizza shop. So he's trying to make it as authentic as possible. In 1961, something is brought out called the head sight. To understand how we get to something that looks like the headsets like I use today, and maybe you use as well, we have to go back to this invention. Some conditions were just too dangerous for close inspection by a large group of people. So this device was invented for the military to look remotely at a hazardous situation. The Philco Corporation developed a way to link a video screen and a magnetic head tracking system into a helmet. Whatever the viewers saw would be shown on closed circuit television nearby. So this becomes the first head mounted display or HMD. This is the grandfather of what we use today. And you can see similarities, very subtle ones, but you can see similarities between the two devices. Many of you who are watching remember the Viewmaster. This is one that I had as a kid. Perhaps you did as well. Think of it as your earliest form of interacting with something like virtual reality. Stereo views had been around since the photographic revolutions in the mid 19th century, but the Viewmaster, widely disseminated to the public in the 1960s and beyond, gave us an affordable way to feel like we were somewhere else. The wraparound device dropped us into scenes from our favorite movies, sites from around the world, and more. Perhaps you may still have one of these lingering in your closet somewhere. The 1980s allowed us to have a new look at virtual reality, but virtual reality becomes something for the very wealthy. The first commercialized VR system was called Reality Built for Two. As you can see, two people here. Developed by VPL Research, Reality Built for Two introduced the world to VR headsets with corresponding gloves called the Data Glove. With the glove, you could twist and turn objects and you, you could see on the screen in the VR environment. But this came at a price. $100,000 was the price tag for the pair, but there was a discounted option for $50,000. Not too accessible for the average person, but we're starting to see these new technologies working together. You have the headsets and you also have a glove. Later, this will become the handheld paddles like we use today. So you can see that this is basically the grandfather or the great uncle of that. And look how far we've come. You can now go to the store and buy something like I just showed you here. VR is much more accessible. At a price tag of around $400, Meta's Oculus Quest 2 has become one of the best known VR tools in the world. This is the device that I use for my gaming and educational experiences. This is my first VR device. By the end of this year, VR devices are expected to have a cumulative sales number of 25 million units. And many of those 25 million units will be uploading historically based games for its users. And obviously that's what we're going to talk about tonight. What are some of our options? How do we interact with the past? And where are we going from here? And I'm going to give you three different gaming options or virtual reality experiences that you can experience for yourself and why they are different and how they go into this idea of seeing the past in new ways. The first one I would like to talk about is called Warplanes 
battle over the Pacific or battles over the Pacific. In 2023, Home Net Games released Warplanes Battles Over the Pacific. Previously, they released Warplanes World War I Fighters. But for our discussion this evening, I'm going to focus on this game since this one is one that I'm playing currently. As you enter the game, you are given a series of tasks to complete to learn the basics about flying an aircraft, at least in VR. You learn where the throttle is, how to move the stick, how to fire the guns. All of this is controlled with your Oculus hand controllers. By the end of the training, you are pressing buttons to lower and raise the landing gears while backing off of the throttle with your other hand to perform tighter turns and learning how to land without crashing into the ground. You get this idea of I have to use both of my hands to progress through the stages of this kind of training, just like you would with a real aircraft. As far as in-game action is concerned, only after this initial round of training do you get placed in scenarios where you have battles between yourself and other aircraft, much like you would have been trained during the Second World War. You don't just get taken up and start a dogfight. You learn the training of how to get into the air, how to land, how to maneuver your aircraft. You will go on missions against Japanese Navy and other installations. 15 aircraft are at your disposal in this game, and you can also bring your friends along for the journey as long as they have the proper VR gaming device and the game downloaded. So we have this sense of community of people who are interested in a similar thing. In addition, there is a player versus player mode, what we call PVP, where you battle it out with players from around the world to see who the best person is in that particular battle. But what happens when we fail a mission in this game or any other game that we may be talking about? This is where it gets a little bit more technical as far as the psychology of gaming in general. I want you to think about our digital selves. We take on a new life when we go into these games. How many times have we played a game and said, oh, I died. I fell off the building, I beat the boss, and so on. We don't normally say my character died or my character survived the Oregon Trail. We tend to take on the life, if you will, of the characters we play. It's what can be referred to as our digital self. Studies have shown that when we interact with characters that we play in a game, we momentarily take on that quote, other life. Taking on this other self can have immense impact on our emotions during the game. We're heavily invested in succeeding with our digital self. This creates a desire to succeed, as we'll see, a desire to learn, and a desire to see a new space and time in the past. With virtual reality, this sense of having a digital self is amplified because for the moment, the world around us is shut off. All we see is what is in front of us. We're concentrating on the screen and therefore the room around us is blocked off. Sometimes this can lead to disasters. People run into furniture or other things around their house, but it really shows you how invested we are with becoming part of the gaming experience. One of the most moving and memorable VR experiences is the Anne Frank house in VR. You can see we've switched now. We've gone from what we would consider a gaming experience into what we would call more of an educational kind of experience. When we were in school, many of us read the diary of Anne Frank, the story of a young Jewish girl who went into hiding with her family in Amsterdam to try to escape Nazi persecution. Her two-year confinement in this home is wonderfully detailed within Anne's diary, which includes very personal feelings of the realities of conflict on a civilian population and the horrors of not knowing what may happen next to Anne and all of her family. The Anne Frank House VR experience is the very definition of making history accessible to the world. 
all of the rooms are furnished just how they were during the Second World War. Built by Vertigo Games, this app is available in English, German, Dutch, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Hebrew. Again, allowing this accessibility to be here for the masses. When you first enter Anne's world, you don't simply walk around the home freely. Initially, you go on a 25 minute tour of the structure itself. You're directed through various snippets of Anne's life. You're introduced to family and friends. You learn about various characters who are loved and lost. You go on a virtual introduction as if you're meeting these people in their home or in their space. You see Anne as a toddler, as we do in the bottom photo there in the center. And you see Anne as we've come to know her as a young woman, young girl, trying to understand the world around her. These are screenshots from the gameplay that I have done uh, within my VR headset. So they are a little bit grainy, but believe me, it is a very detailed and moving experience to be introduced to not only Anne, but her entire family and those within her sphere. Notice the footprints. This guides you through the entire game, the hand on the wall, it's actually a door and you can push that open. You can also see our hand, which we control with the pad in our hands in the bottom of this image. It is very user-friendly to do this. It's made for various age groups and audiences. This provides us ample opportunity to interact with objects, understand how big or small the spaces within the house are, and even learn to navigate the house ourselves. Because after this initial kind of walkthrough with Anne and another narrator, we are on our own. Anne has basically become our docent during this round of activity. She's leading us through her world, telling us her story, talking about her childhood. This segment is a short video that I filmed while uh, engaged with this particular application. You see how Anne's world is as you are guided through the story. We will walk over to a radio on the other side of the room and using our hand controller, like I held up earlier, we'll turn the radio on to hear the latest broadcast from the BBC. And as it is playing, an excerpt from Anne's diary will be read to us by voiceover. This is D-Day. The English radio said and felt death. The writer said, this is D-Day. The invasion has begun. The annex in an uproar. Could it really be that the long-awaited liberation is on its way? The liberation about which we talk so much, but that is still too lovely, too fabulous to ever come true. Could this year, this 1944 granted victory, we don't know yet either, but the hope that springs eternal makes us brave, gives us renewed strength. You can see how this can connect you with the past in a new way. Not only are you moving around of space, which is supposed to emulate the 1940s with all its furnishings, but now you are interacting with objects which provides you news broadcasts or something else, maybe music. And you're also being taken through the life of a young person who is living through this horrific existence of being sealed off from the world and in hiding from oppression. When we finish our initial tour, we're told about the loss that Anne's father felt until his death. We see an image of Otto on the right, 
staring off into the distance as if remembering all that his family had been through. And we hear about Anne's legacy. Her diary, the diary of a young girl, has been published in over 70 languages, and it has become one of the most translated books in history. And we are given the opportunity to look at a still of her book in multiple languages. This particular VR experience is available worldwide and is also used in thousands of classrooms around the world, truly showing you the power of virtual reality and the historic space. The final one that I wish to talk with you about this evening is Titanic VR. And we just had some more Titanic news drop within the last few days. This is the perfect time to talk about Titanic in VR. Released in 2018 by Immersive VR Education Limited, Titanic VR is playable in your VR headset and on your desktop. So if you don't have a VR headset yet, here's one that you can play on your desktop. To gain the full experience though, I highly recommend using a VR device. Viewers get to witness the sinking of the ship in 1912, explore the wreck using the remotely operated vehicle, as you see there in the picture, the ROV, and more. This is a story-driven experience, so you can have a deeper involvement with the history instead of simply diving down to the wreck itself. You play the role of Dr. Ethan Lynch, and you're on a quest for various clues hidden within the shipwreck. These clues lead to greater understandings of the stories of those who were on board and how the doomed ship perished on that April morning 111 years ago. Some of the later quests lose their educational luster, but overall the experience is very much worth the time engaged. So you get to have two separate ship experiences. You get to see the Titanic two miles down, and you get to have your immersive experience on the ship that is conducting all of the research, just as we would today. For us historians, what's most gripping about the experience are the stories, the stories that survivors have shared over a century. They are brought back to life on board Titanic VR in various ways. You even find yourself sitting in a lifeboat as it is rowed away from the great ship. Around you are women and children who have just been separated, probably forever, from their fathers or husbands. The reality of the disaster sets in through these vignettes and legitimate oral histories. But what do we consider this genre of gaming as a whole? This is something different. This is taking the Oregon Trail and putting it into a new context, right? This isn't what we played on the monitors in the 1980s and the 1990s. This is something new. And what this is now considered is edutainment, a word that many of you may have never heard of before, a word maybe some of you have heard of. This title, the VR, uh, the Titanic VR, fits under the auspices of edutainment. Edutainment is entertainment, that also carries an educational aspect. This is to make learning enjoyable for a wide range of audiences. For decades, the idea of play was placed into our lives as a way of learning. This is not a new concept. It now just has a flashy name. As some of you may know, I'm a gamer on Twitch as well, and the platform was developed in 2011 and has since exploded onto the gaming scene. This is basically thanks in large part to the pandemic that we just had. And also in 2014, it was acquired by Amazon. I began to stream on the platform a few years ago as a way to play historically based games and talk about them with those in my live chat. As I progress through a game, we talk about the finer points, its weaknesses, its strengths, and so much more. Indeed, we discuss how else we are entertained by the past, such as movies, books, music, and more. The VR experience is no different. We want to feel like we are part of something else, another time, another place, another life. 
This allows us to have that personal connection with the past that is so necessary when trying to place ourselves within a historical event. How would I have acted? What would I have done to make the situation different? These are questions that are sometimes raised by virtual reality titles, because at times you get to manip manipulate things physically in that digital world. It comes to life in a new way. And we know as historians or people who are really into history, people who study the past, if we have a personal connection with it, we are more likely to study a lot more of it and maintain that personal connection, that sense of being involved in the learning process. By 2030, the digital gaming industry may be worth the close to $500 billion. Yet in the history field, there are some who still consider it to be child's play. I totally disagree with this. There are publishing companies who are devoting entire series to digital gaming, virtual reality, and the humanities. Indeed, when I attend Brock University this fall, we have an entire digital humanities lab and department where students are constructing new ways for us to interact with the past, including digital games and applications. The way we interact with history changes even more rapidly than how we can see it, how our collective historical memory perceives the past. Historians such as I must be prepared to not only understand what is going on with how our audience gains their curiosities about the past, how you get involved with it, but also how to harness this medium individually to create a quality learning experience. This will always be about accessibility and learning for many of us in the digital humanity realm. And virtual reality allows you to connect with the past like never before. And there are literally scores of titles that are history based titles that you can download and see for yourself and learn how you may have been in a previous life take on that digital self it may impact your historical memory but it is all a learning experience to some degree and one that should not be ignored thank you so much for your time with this project it is just in its infancy and there is so much more to come in the years and decades that are well ahead of us all right thank you so much john thank you mike does anyone have any questions feel free to unmute yourselves Oh, hello, John. Hi, Chris. How are you? Hey, thanks for everything. Yeah, I want to talk about how this relates in addition to um, relates to theater and stage plays. I've been a lifelong stage actor myself. I'm also an amateur playwright. I have a play about the UFO events of the 1980s actually going around some local play playhouses and a story not everyone knew. But I, I've noticed that uh, stage plays have a power that a movie does not have. With a live theater, you have immediate interaction with the actors. And immersive theater is quite the rage. From, from everything from Disney to the New York Playhouses are, are doing it. Like you have Sleep No More, which is based on Shakespeare's Macbeth, where you go from one room to another to another. And I would just ask, what specifically to the relation to stage plays and theaters that virtual reality could personally have on it, even revolutionize going to a play in the future? Mm, that's a fantastic question, Chris, because we are having so many new digital experiences, not just gaming on VR, but also just being in a place. I think we're going to be seeing that well into the future. Uh, I, I know that you can now sit courtside at an NBA game in VR. It's live. It's going on. Uh, this is probably going to help a lot of people go to a theater or see some form of entertainment that they would love to witness, but maybe they can't get there due to accessibility issues, geography, finances. Uh, I think that's really going to help 
to bring people into that spectrum of what is going on uh, with this play or what is going on at this event. I think it's all about accessibility and learning. And I think you're absolutely right on the fact that uh, these new ways of experiencing a play, even a Shakespearean play, are going to be uh, pushed to new boundaries, which I think is a beautiful thing. And really, I think when we can put on a headset uh, that will probably come down in price as more competition comes out in the, in the coming years, I think we're going to have a really great boom of accessibility to productions where people just can't be there uh, or they, they physically can't be there due to constraints. Um, I really think it has some very good potential to help out with, with plugging your work uh, and others. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a question in the chat. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Francesca, welcome in. Yeah, what, so. What's to say? Uh, one question I have is what tools do we have to create VR experiences that do not trivialize historic events, but also do not become overwhelming for a viewer to witness? That's a fantastic question because uh, thank you for that question because there are some things, we still have this idea of ethics with, uh, with virtual reality. Some things we shouldn't be putting in virtual reality. Uh, some things are off limits to, to a lot of these organizations and, and, and uh, presenters to be putting on here. Uh, there are different things which um, we have to look at when we're considering the trivialization of the past. Uh, we have to be looking at, is this all being done in good faith, number one. Number two, who's the research team involved with this and what is their end goal with this particular event that we're talking about? Because it's pretty easy to trivialize things uh, and, and possibly to make fun of certain things. So, uh, people do that on a day-to-day -day basis. I think what's really inspiring about the VR experiences uh, that I have witnessed is that some involve oral histories from the people who were actually there. And, and when you can take a lot of the historical narrative and place it into something that we call edutainment, you're going to help offset that idea of trivialization. Uh, this isn't going to be like a, a Red Dead Redemption thing. And then this is seen as a documentary about the Wild West or whatever the case may be. Uh, but when you look at some of the developing teams, historians are starting to become part of the developmental teams. And uh, which is a great thing for we historians who are seeing that we're meeting some roadblocks in our places to finding employment. Uh, but we're finding it now in these developmental teams. So I would look into the different types of uh, teams that are out there and what they are developing. You can get a pattern from that and you can see, are they making this for the right reason or are they making it just to make money? And uh, that really points you to, are they trivializing something or are they allowing you to be a witness towards something bigger than yourself? I really think that's a proper way to go with it. The, it researching the background of the developmental team is a big one. And uh, we have to be careful with this, just like any other video game or digital game that we would see on our PC or on our uh, PlayStations or Xbox or whatever. We have to walk that fine line of, are you trivializing the past by doing something in this particular game setting uh it's a it's a very fine line to walk and there are gaming ethics out there believe it or not thank you for the question i really appreciate that again yeah oh john i just had one more the Anne <laughs> frank i i did visit and it mm -hmm. it was incredible to go there because there was a sorrow you felt I, I really, it's, it's sort of difficult to put into words, but you could just feel it's like the negative energy was still there. It just went, I took a tour of the house and it, it felt like you're in the times and it it, uh, it was much a downer for otherwise good vacation, but it, it was nothing compared to what my great uncle liberated a concentration camp. And he just mm -hmm. found what he witnessed an atrocity behind, beyond words, really. See these human skeletons come out and 
he was telling me never let anyone tell you it didn't happen because it happened for sure. And and he, he thought words really couldn't describe how awful it was. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this should or should not be depicted in, in a virtual reality setting, given given the power of, of, of and the atrocity of what happened? That's exactly what I was thinking of when uh, when we were just talking about trivializing historical uh, events. I immediately my head went to the Holocaust and how do we capture that moment without trivializing the event, uh, without seemingly making money on a horrific event such as that. Uh, the Anne Frank House absolutely does the right thing through the VR experience. Uh, and as you said, I haven't been to the Anne Frank House. I want to visit someday. This is as close as I can get right now. Uh, I think that you're going to see more things like that from areas where survivors were uh, were placed uh, afterwards, uh, where they had to move and, and where they were taken from, et cetera. I think that you're going to see a lot more museums pick up on a VR experience as well. We've seen this in augmented reality, but I think they're going to start picking up on virtual reality when it becomes more affordable to film certain things or make these experiences. And I think that's probably the way around uh, allowing it to be trivialized when it can be done on a professional manner by an, a by a body such as the Anne Frank House or the the Tenement Museum or or someone along that line, where there's name recognition and it's respected. I think that's when we can uh, secure the story for future generations, if you will, against that trivialization. And I completely I worry about this as well constantly because uh we worry about any technology and what it can be used for uh, it's it's something that we don't want to cross that line but i think again like looking at the the developmental teams looking at the museums that produce this or the people on the staff of the museums can help us to uh bring these sort of experiences to life without pushing that limit of things that we really shouldn't see we, we don't want certain audiences seeing it. And I mean, like kids seeing certain things. Uh, but you're kind of walking a fine line, right? Where it's like you want to be able to tell the story with its kind of horror so it never happens again. But you don't want to look like you're trivializing. It is a very fine line that historians and, and developers have to walk and uh, much respect to those who do, much respect to those like the Anne Frank House and the, the Holocaust Museums. Uh, they walk that line all the time, but they do it professionally. And I think that's what would help create good VR experiences. On a lighter note, do you see this coming to escape rooms possibly? It, it seems like it would plug in fairly well. Uh, there, there are, believe it or not, some VR escape rooms already out there. So uh, I would think that certain escape room organizations would want to latch on to that as well. But there are just people who make VR escape rooms. Uh, there are people who make, uh, you know, uh, VR discotheques in Europe and all kinds of stuff. So it's, it's crossing all kinds of divides now. So I can really see p things like uh, escape rooms latching on to it and making it something that uh, is memorable for a lot of the, the people who are the kind that want to get locked in a room together. I'm, I'm not into that sort of thing. <laughs> it's a little bit out of my, my realm. I'm, I, I get a little nervous. Uh, but I, I do want to say, uh, uh, Mike, I don't want to cut off you, you leading the convo here. Uh, but Greg has a great question in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, that I mentioned financial issues with an Oculus costing $400. Are there other options available that can be used? Uh, there are other options in develop development right now, Greg, excuse me. Uh, but you're, you're easily looking at $350 to $400 for an entry level, a good quality entry level VR headset, which is half to you know two thirds less of what it used to be uh and four hundred dollars is a lot of money to a lot of people it's just a lot of money to me it was an investment uh but i really think that as newer 
uh, technologies come out, new headsets, mm -hmm. new devices come out, things like mine are going to drop in value because now it's it's not the the new shiny thing mm -hmm. out there. And then more accessibility will happen because you might be able to get the the one that was the older model for half the price and at least get a start and get involved with it. Uh, but there are newer models coming out, but I haven't seen any so far under $400 on the horizon. So it's still a chunk of change. I understand. John, Thanks. I have a question. Are there, yeah. are there battlefield tours available through VR? Is that something that's been created yet? Uh, there are, uh, there are tours in VR, but not of battlefields just yet. Uh, I have started to record or, uh, attempt to record some battlefield tours in VR, just like I recorded that video on the Anne Frank house. Uh, the problem for me is that I only get about a minute of, of time, so I can't really do it. Uh, what you're seeing now is a lot of people who are using the mapping programs that we have online, such as Google Maps or Google Earth, and they are taking you to the spot that way with the three-dimensional buildings and, 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 and terrain and things like that. Uh, I definitely see this being a thing in the future where you will have uh, the ability to say that you are a VR tour guide and you are taking people on a tour of a location in VR using some of the things that we currently have on the market uh, in VR. There is a great program called Wonder, W-A-N-D-E-R, like you're wandering around. And you can actually basically use uh, almost like a Google Maps set up from Street View, and you can go anywhere in the world. There's going to be what's next is someone's going to be able to appear in front of you who's also in VR with you, and you are leading a tour of the Coliseum or or somewhere in Europe or the United States, uh, that's going to be the next thing. And, uh, it's already, there are people already trying to, trying to do it and they're experimenting with it. I've experimented with it. Uh, but we still kind of go back to the old Google earth kind of thing for right now. Uh, and, uh, I've actually led, uh, you know, half hour tours of battlefields on Google earth before I go into a game and show you the differences between the game terrain and the real terrain. The next step is putting that into VR and that, that will happen. And I'm sure someone out there is probably way ahead of me, uh, doing that, but I'm looking forward.